The House of Mirth by Edith Wharton Book One, Chapter Three Bridge at Bellamont usually lasted till the small hours, and when Lily went to bed that night she had played too long for her own good. Feeling no desire for the self-communion which awaited her in her room, she lingered on the broad stairway, looking down into the hall below, where the last card-players were grouped about the tray of tall glasses and silver-collared decanters, which the butler had just placed on a low table near the fire. The hall was arcaded, with a gallery supported on columns of pale yellow marble. Tall clumps of flowering plants were grouped against a background of dark foliage in the angles of the walls. On the crimson carpet a deer-hound and two or three spaniels dozed luxuriously before the fire, and the light from the great central lantern overhead shed a brightness on the women's hair, and struck sparks from their jewels as they moved. There were moments when such scenes delighted Lily, when they gratified her sense of beauty, and her craving for the external finish of life. There were others when they gave a sharper edge to the meagerness of her own opportunities. This was one of the moments when the sense of contrast was uppermost, and she turned away impatiently as Mrs. George Dorset, glittering in serpentine spangles, drew Percy Grice and her wake to a confidential nook beneath the gallery. It was not that Miss Bart was afraid of losing her newly acquired hold over Mr. Grice. Mrs. Dorset might startle or dazzle him, but she had neither the skill nor the patience to effect his capture. She was too self-engrossed to penetrate the recesses of his shyness. And besides, why should she care to give herself the trouble? At most it might amuse her to make sport of his simplicity for an evening. After that he would be merely a burden to her. And knowing this, she was far too experienced to encourage him. But the mere thought of that other woman, who could take a man up and toss him aside as she willed, without having to regard him as a possible factor in her plans, filled Lily Bart with envy. She had been bored all the afternoon by Percy Grice. The mere thought seemed to waken an echo of his droning voice. But she could not ignore him on the morrow. She must follow up her success, must submit to more boredom, must be ready with fresh compliances and adaptabilities, and all on the bare chance that he might ultimately decide to do her the honour of boring her for life. It was a hateful fate. But how escape from it? What choice had she? To be herself, or a Gertie Farish. As she entered her bedroom, with its softly shaded lights, her lace dressing-gown lying across the silken bedspread, her little embroidered slippers before the fire, a vase of carnations filling the air with perfume, and the last novels and magazines lying uncut on a table beside the reading-lamp, she had a vision of Miss Farish's cramped flat, with its cheap conveniences and hideous wallpapers. No, she was not made for mean and shabby surroundings, for the squalid compromises of poverty. Her whole being dilated in an atmosphere of luxury. It was the background she required, the only climate she could breathe in. But the luxury of others was not what she wanted. A few years ago it had sufficed her. She had taken her daily meed of pleasure without caring who provided it. Now she was beginning to chafe at the obligations it imposed to feel herself a mere pensioner on the splendour which had once seemed to belong to her. There were even moments when she was conscious of having to pay her way. For a long time she had refused to play bridge. She knew she could not afford it, and she was afraid of acquiring so expensive a taste. She had seen the danger exemplified in more than one of her associates, in young Ned Silverton, for instance, the charming fair boy now seated in abject rapture at the elbow of Mrs. Fisher a striking divorcee with eyes and gowns as emphatic as the headlines of her case. Lily could remember when young Silverton had stumbled into their circle, with the air of a strayed Arcadian, who has published Shamung sonnets in his college journal. Since then he had developed a taste for Mrs. Fisher and Bridge, and the latter at least had involved him in expenses from which he had been more than once rescued by harassed maiden sisters, who treasured the sonnets, and went without sugar in their tea to keep their darling afloat. Ned's case was familiar to Lily. She had seen his charming eyes, which had a good deal more poetry in them than the sonnets, change from surprise to amusement, and from amusement to anxiety, as he passed under the spell of the terrible god of chance, and she was afraid of discovering the same symptoms in her own case. For in the last year she had found that her hostesses expected her to take a place at the card-table, 
It was one of the taxes she had to pay for their prolonged hospitality, and for the dresses and trinkets which occasionally replenished her insufficient wardrobe. And since she had played regularly, the passion had grown on her. Once or twice of late she had won a large sum, and instead of keeping it against future losses, had spent it in dress or jewellery, and the desire to atone for this imprudence, combined with the increasing exhilaration of the game, drove her to risk higher stakes at each fresh venture. She tried to excuse herself on the plea that, in the Trenor set, if one played at all one must either play high, or be set down as priggish or stingy. But she knew that the gambling passion was upon her, and that in her present surroundings there was small hope of resisting it. To-night the luck had been persistently bad, and the little gold purse which hung among her trinkets was almost empty when she returned to her room. She unlocked the wardrobe, and taking out her jewel-case, looked under the tray for the roll of bills from which she had replenished the purse before going down to dinner. Only twenty dollars were left. The discovery was so startling that for a moment she fancied she must have been robbed. Then she took paper and pencil, and seating herself at the writing-table, tried to reckon up what she had spent during the day. Her head was throbbing with fatigue, and she had to go over the figures again and again. But at last it became clear to her that she had lost three hundred dollars at cards. She took out her check-book to see if her balance was larger than she remembered, but found that she had erred in the other direction. Then she returned to her calculations, but figure as she would, she could not conjure back the vanished three hundred dollars. It was a sum she had set aside to pacify her dressmaker, unless she should decide to use it as a sop to the jeweller. At any rate, she had so many uses for it that its very insufficiency had caused her to play high in the hope of doubling it. But of course she had lost— she who needed every penny, while Bertha Dorset, whose husband showered money on her, must have pocketed at least five hundred, and Judy Trenor, who could have afforded to lose a thousand a night, had left the table clutching such a heap of bills that she had been unable to shake hands with her guests when they bade her good night. A world in which such things could be seemed a miserable place to Lily Bart, but then she had never been able to understand the laws of a universe which was so ready to leave her out of its calculations. She began to undress without ringing for her maid, whom she had sent to bed. She had been long enough in bondage to other people's pleasure to be considerate of those who depended on hers, and in her bitter moods it sometimes struck her that she and her maid were in the same position, except that the latter received her wages more regularly. As she sat before the mirror brushing her hair, her face looked hollow and pale, and she was frightened by two little lines near her mouth, faint flaws in the smooth curve of the cheek. Oh, I must stop worrying," she exclaimed. Unless it's the electric light. She reflected, springing up from her seat and lighting the candles on the dressing table. She turned out the wall lights and peered at herself between the candle flames. The white oval of her face swam out waveringly from a background of shadows, the uncertain light blurring it like a haze. But the two lines about the mouth remained. Lily rose and undressed in haste. It is only because I am tired, and have such odious things to think about," she kept repeating, and it seemed an added injustice that petty cares should leave a trace on the beauty which was her only defence against them. But the odious things were there, and remained with her. She returned wearily to the thought of Percy Grice, as a wayfarer picks up a heavy load and toils on after a brief rest. She was almost sure she had landed him. A few days' work and she would win her reward. But the reward itself seemed unpalatable just then. She could get no zest from the thought of victory. It would be a rest from worry, no more, and how little that would have seemed to her a few years earlier. Her ambitions had shrunk gradually in the desiccating air of failure. But why had she failed? Was it her own fault, or that of destiny? She remembered how her mother, after they had lost their money, used to say to her with a kind of fierce vindictiveness, but you'll get it all back, you'll get it all back with your face." The remembrance roused a whole train of association, and she lay in the darkness reconstructing the past out of which her present had grown. A house in which no one ever dined at home unless there was company, a doorbell perpetually ringing, a hall-table showered with square envelopes which were opened in haste, and oblong envelopes which were allowed to gather dust in the depths of a bronze jar. A series of French and English maids giving warning amid a chaos of hurriedly ransacked wardrobes and dress-closets. 
an equally changing dynasty of nurses and footmen, quarrels in the pantry, the kitchen, and the drawing-room, precipitate trips to Europe, and returns with gorged trunks and days of interminable unpacking, semi-annual discussions as to where the summer should be spent, gray interludes of economy, and brilliant reactions of expense. Such was the setting of Lily Bart's first memories. Ruling the turbulent element called home was the vigorous and determined figure of a mother still young enough to dance her ball-dresses to rags, while the hazy outline of a neutral-tinted father filled an indeterminate space between the butler and the man who came to wind the clocks. Even to the eyes of infancy, Mrs. Hudson Bart had appeared young, but Lily could not recall the time when her father had not been bald and slightly stooping, with streaks of grey in his hair, and a tired walk. It was a shock to her to learn afterward that he was but two years older than her mother. Lily seldom saw her father by daylight. All day he was downtown, and in winter it was long after nightfall when she heard his fagged step on the stairs, and his hand on the schoolroom door. He would kiss her in silence, and ask one or two questions of the nurse or the governess. Then Mrs. Bart's maid would come to remind him that he was dining out, and he would hurry away with a nod to Lily. In summer, when he joined them for a Sunday at Newport or Southampton, he was even more effaced and silent than in winter. It seemed to tire him to rest, and he would sit for hours staring at the sea-line from a quiet corner of the veranda, while the clatter of his wife's existence went on unheeded a few feet off. Generally, however, Mrs. Bart and Lily went to Europe for the summer, and before the steamer was halfway over, Mr. Bart had dipped below the horizon. Sometimes his daughter heard him denounced for having neglected to forward Mrs. Bart's remittances. But for the most part, he was never mentioned or thought of, till his patient stooping figure presented itself on the New York dock, as a buffer between the magnitude of his wife's luggage and the restrictions of the American custom-house. In this desultory yet agitated fashion, life went on through Lily's teens, a zigzag broken course, down which the family craft glided on a rapid current of amusement, tugged at by the underflow of perpetual need, the need of more money. Lily could not recall the time when there had been money enough, and in some vague way her father seemed always to blame for the deficiency. It could certainly not be the fault of Mrs. Bart, who was spoken of by her friends as a wonderful manager. Mrs. Bart was famous for the unlimited effect she produced on limited means, and to the lady and her acquaintances there was something heroic in living as though one were much richer than one's bank-book denoted. Lily was naturally proud of her mother's aptitude in this line. She had been brought up in the faith that, whatever it cost, one must have a good cook, and be what Mrs. Bart called decently dressed. Mrs. Bart's worst reproach to her husband was to ask him if he expected her to live like a pig, and his replying in the negative was always regarded as a justification for cabling to Paris for an extra dress or two, and telephoning to the jeweller that he might, after all, send home the turquoise bracelet which Mrs. Bart had looked at that morning. Lily knew people who lived like pigs, and their appearance and surroundings justified her mother's repugnance to that form of existence. They were mostly cousins, who inhabited dingy houses with engravings from Cole's Voyage of Life on the drawing-room walls, and slatternly parlour-maids who said, I'll go and see, to visitors calling at an hour when all right-minded persons are conventionally, if not actually, out. The disgusting part of it was that many of these cousins were rich, so that Lily imbibed the idea that if people lived like pigs, it was from choice, and through the lack of any proper standard of conduct. This gave her a sense of reflected superiority, and she did not need Mrs. Bart's comments on the family frumps and misers to foster her naturally lively taste for splendor. Lily was nineteen when circumstances caused her to revise her view of the universe. The previous year she had made a dazzling debut fringed by a heavy thundercloud of bills. The light of the debut still lingered on the horizon, but the cloud had thickened, and suddenly it broke. The suddenness added to the horror— and there were still times when Lily relived with painful vividness every detail of the day on which the blow fell. She and her mother had been seated at the luncheon-table, over the chauffois and cold salmon of the previous night's dinner. It was one of Mrs. Bart's few economies to consume in private the expensive remnants of her hospitality. Lily was feeling the pleasant languor which is youth's penalty for dancing till dawn, but her mother, in spite of a few lines about the mouth, and under the yellow waves on her temples, was as alert, determined, and high in colour 
as if she had risen from an untroubled sleep. In the centre of the table, between the melting marron glace and candied cherries, a pyramid of American beauties lifted their vigorous stems. They held their heads as high as Mrs. Bart, but their rose-colour had turned to a dissipated purple, and Lily's sense of fitness was disturbed by their reappearance on the luncheon-table. "'I really think, mother,' she said reproachfully, "'we might afford a few fresh flowers for luncheon. Just some jonquils or lilies of the valley.' Mrs. Bart stared. Her own fastidiousness had its eye fixed on the world, and she did not care how the luncheon-table looked when there was no one present at it but the family. But she smiled at her daughter's innocence. "'Lilies of the valley,' she said calmly, "'cost two dollars a dozen at this season.' Lily was not impressed. She knew very little of the value of money. "'It would not take more than six dozen to fill that bowl,' she argued. Six dozen what?' asked her father's voice in the doorway. The two women looked up in surprise. Though it was a Saturday, the sight of Mr. Bart at luncheon was an unwanted one. But neither his wife nor his daughter was sufficiently interested to ask an explanation. Mr. Bart dropped into a chair, and sat gazing absently at the fragment of jellied salmon which the butler had placed before him. "'I was only saying,' Lily began, "'that I hate to see faded flowers at luncheon, and Mother says a bunch of lilies of the valley would not cost more than twelve dollars. Mayn't I tell the florist to send a few every day?' She leaned confidently toward her father. He seldom refused her anything, and Mrs. Bart had taught her to plead with him when her own entreaties failed. Mr. Bart sat motionless, his gaze still fixed on the salmon, and his lower jaw dropped. He looked even paler than usual, and his thin hair lay in untidy streaks on his forehead. Suddenly he looked at his daughter, and laughed. The laugh was so strange that Lily coloured under it. She disliked being ridiculed, and her father seemed to see something ridiculous in the request. Perhaps he thought it foolish that she should trouble him about such a trifle. Twelve dollars! Twelve dollars a day for flowers! Oh, certainly, my dear! Give him an order for twelve hundred! He continued to laugh. Mrs. Bart gave him a quick glance. You needn't wait, Polworth. I will ring for you, she said to the butler. The butler withdrew with an air of silent disapproval, leaving the remains of the chauffeur on the sideboard. What is the matter, Hudson? Are you ill? said Mrs. Bart severely. She had no tolerance for scenes which were not of her own making, and it was odious to her that her husband should make a show of himself before the servants. "'Are you ill?' she repeated. "'Ill? No. I'm ruined,' he said. Lily made a frightened sound, and Mrs. Bart rose to her feet. "'Ruined!' she cried. But controlling herself instantly, she turned a calm face to Lily. "'Shut the pantry door.' she said. Lily obeyed, and when she turned back into the room her father was sitting with both elbows on the table, the plate of salmon between them, and his head bowed on his hands. Mrs. Bart stood over him with a white face which made her hair unnaturally yellow. She looked at Lily as the latter approached. Her look was terrible. But her voice was modulated to a ghastly cheerfulness. "'Your father is not well. He doesn't know what he is saying.' It is nothing, but you had better go upstairs, and don't talk to the servants," she added. Lily obeyed. She always obeyed when her mother spoke in that voice. She had not been deceived by Mrs. Bart's words. She knew at once that they were ruined. In the dark hours which followed, that awful fact overshadowed even her father's slow and difficult dying. To his wife he no longer counted. He had become extinct when he ceased to fulfil his purpose and she sat at his side with the provisional air of a traveller who waits for a belated train to start. Lily's feelings were softer. She pitied him in a frightened, ineffectual way. But the fact that he was for the most part unconscious, and that his attention, when she stole into the room, drifted away from her after a moment, made him even more of a stranger than in the nursery days when he had never come home till after dark. She seemed always to have seen him through a blur, first of sleepiness, than of distance and indifference, and now the fog had thickened till he was almost indistinguishable. If she could have performed any little services for him, or have exchanged with him a few of those affecting words which an extensive perusal of fiction had led her to connect with such occasions, the filial instinct might have stirred in her. But her pity, 
finding no active expression, remained in a state of spectatorship, overshadowed by her mother's grim, unflagging resentment. Every look and act of Mrs. Bart's seemed to say, "'You are sorry for him now, but you will feel differently when you see what he has done to us.' It was a relief to Lily when her father died. Then a long winter set in. There was a little money left, but to Mrs. Bart it seemed worse than nothing, the mere mockery of what she was entitled to. What was the use of living if one had to live like a pig? She sank into a kind of furious apathy, a state of inert anger against fate. Her faculty for managing deserted her, or she no longer took sufficient pride in it to exert it. It was well enough to manage, when by doing so one could keep one's own carriage. But when one's best contrivance did not conceal the fact that one had to go on foot, the effort was no longer worth making. Lily and her mother wandered from place to place, now paying long visits to relations whose housekeeping Mrs. Bart criticized, and who deplored the fact that she let Lily breakfast in bed when the girl had no prospects before her, and now vegetating in cheap continental refuges, where Mrs. Bart held herself fiercely aloof from the frugal tea-tables of her companions in misfortune. She was especially careful to avoid her old friends, and the scenes of her former successes. To be poor seemed to her such a confession of failure, that it amounted to disgrace, and she detected a note of condescension in the friendliest advances. Only one thought consoled her, and that was the contemplation of Lily's beauty. She studied it with a kind of passion, as though it were some weapon she had slowly fashioned for her vengeance. It was the last asset in their fortunes the nucleus around which their life was to be rebuilt. She watched it jealously, as though it were her own property and Lily its mere custodian, and she tried to instil into the latter a sense of the responsibility that such a charge involved. She followed in imagination the career of other beauties, pointing out to her daughter what might be achieved through such a gift, and dwelling on the awful warning of those who, in spite of it, had failed to get what they wanted. To Mrs. Bart, only stupidity could explain the lamentable denouement of some of her examples. She was not above the inconsistency of charging fate, rather than herself, with her own misfortunes. But she inveighed so acrimoniously against love-matches, that Lily would have fancied her own marriage had been of that nature, had not Mrs. Bart frequently assured her that she had been talked into it, by whom she never made clear. Lily was duly impressed by the magnitude of her opportunities. The dinginess of her present life threw into enchanting relief the existence to which she felt herself entitled. To a less illuminated intelligence, Mrs. Bart's counsels might have been dangerous, but Lily understood that beauty is only the raw material of conquest, and that to convert it into success, other arts are required. She knew that to betray any sense of superiority was a subtler form of the stupidity her mother denounced, and it did not take her long to learn that a beauty needs more tact than the possessor of an average set of features. Her ambitions were not as crude as Mrs. Bart's. It had been among that lady's grievances that her husband, in the early days, before he was too tired, had wasted his evenings in what she vaguely described as reading poetry. And among the effects packed off to auction after his death were a score or two of dingy volumes which had struggled for existence among the boots and medicine bottles of his dressing-room shelves. There was in Lily a vein of sentiment, perhaps transmitted from this source, which gave an idealizing touch to her most prosaic purposes. She liked to think of her beauty as a power for good, as giving her the opportunity to attain a position where she should make her influence felt in the vague diffusion of refinement and good taste. She was fond of pictures and flowers, and of sentimental fiction, and she could not help thinking that the possession of such tastes ennobled her desire for worldly advantages. She would not indeed have cared to marry a man who was merely rich, she was secretly ashamed of her mother's crude passion for money. Lily's preference would have been for an English nobleman, with political ambitions and vast estates. Or, for second choice, an Italian prince with a castle in the Apennines, and a hereditary office in the Vatican. Lost causes had a romantic charm for her, and she liked to picture herself as standing aloof from the vulgar press of the Quirinal, and sacrificing her pleasure to the claims of an immemorial tradition. How long ago— and how far off it all seemed. Those ambitions were hardly more futile and childish than the earlier ones which had centred about the possessions of a French-jointed doll with real hair. Was it only ten years since she had wavered in imagination between the English earl and the Italian prince? Relentlessly her mind travelled on over the dreary interval. 
After two years of hungry roaming, Mrs. Bart had died. Died of a deep disgust. She had hated dinginess, and it was her fate to be dingy. Her visions of a brilliant marriage for Lily had faded after the first year. "'People can't marry you if they don't see you. And how can they see you in these holes where we're stuck?' That was the burden of her lament. And her last adjuration to her daughter was to escape from dinginess if she could. Don't let it creep up on you, and drag you down. Fight your way out of it somehow. You're young, and can do it," she insisted. She had died during one of their brief visits to New York, and there Lily at once became the centre of a family council, composed of the wealthy relatives whom she had been taught to despise for living like pigs. It may be that they had an inkling of the sentiments in which she had been brought up, for none of them manifested a very lively desire for her company. Indeed, the question threatened to remain unsolved, till Mrs. Peniston, with a sigh, announced, "'I'll try her for a year.' Every one was surprised, but one and all concealed their surprise, lest Mrs. Peniston should be alarmed by it into reconsidering her decision. Mrs. Peniston was Mr. Bart's widowed sister, and if she was by no means the richest of the family group, its other members nevertheless abounded in reasons why she was clearly destined by Providence to assume the charge of Lily. In the first place, she was alone, and it would be charming for her to have a young companion. Then she sometimes travelled, and Lily's familiarity with foreign customs, deplored as a misfortune by her more conservative relatives, would at least enable her to act as a kind of courier. But as a matter of fact, Mrs. Peniston had not been affected by these considerations. She had taken the girl simply because no one else would have her, and because she had the kind of moral mauvaise honte which makes the public display of selfishness difficult though it does not interfere with its private indulgence. It would have been impossible for Mrs. Peniston to be heroic on a desert island, but with the eyes of her little world upon her, she took a certain pleasure in her act. She reaped the reward to which disinterestedness is entitled, and found an agreeable companion in her niece. She had expected to find Lily headstrong, critical, and foreign, for even Mrs. Peniston, though she occasionally went abroad, had the family dread of foreignness. But the girl showed a pliancy, which, to a more penetrating mind than her aunt's, might have been less reassuring than the open selfishness of youth. Misfortune had made Lily supple, instead of hardening her, and a pliable substance is less easy to break than a stiff one. Mrs. Peniston, however, did not suffer from her niece's adaptability. Lily had no intention of taking advantage of her aunt's good nature. She was, in truth, grateful for the refuge offered her. Mrs. Peniston's opulent interior was at least not externally dingy. But dinginess is a quality which assumes all manner of disguises, and Lily soon found that it was as latent in the expensive routine of her aunt's life, as in the makeshift existence of a continental pension. Mrs. Peniston was one of the episodical persons who form the padding of life. It was impossible to believe that she had herself ever been a focus of activities. The most vivid thing about her was the fact that her grandmother had been a Van Alstein, this connection with the well-fed and industrious stock of early New York revealed itself in the glacial neatness of Mrs. Peniston's drawing-room, and in the excellence of her cuisine. She belonged to the class of old New Yorkers who have always lived well, dressed expensively, and done little else. And to these inherited obligations Mrs. Peniston faithfully conformed. She had always been a looker-on at life and her mind resembled one of those little mirrors which her Dutch ancestors were accustomed to affix to their upper windows, so that from the depths of an impenetrable domesticity they might see what was happening in the street. Mrs. Peniston was the owner of a country place in New Jersey, but she had never lived there since her husband's death, a remote event which appeared to dwell in her memory chiefly as a dividing point in the personal reminiscence that formed the staple of her conversation. She was a woman who remembered dates with intensity, and could tell at a moment's notice whether the drawing-room curtains had been renewed before or after Mr. Peniston's last illness. Mrs. Peniston thought the country lonely, and trees damp, and cherished a vague fear of meeting a bull. To guard against such contingencies, she frequented the more populous watering-places, where she installed herself impersonally in a hired house, and looked on at life through the matting screen of her veranda. In the care of such a guardian, it soon became clear to Lily that she was to enjoy only the material advantages of good food and expensive clothing, and though far from underrating these, she would gladly have exchanged them for what Mrs. Bart had taught her to regard as opportunities. She sighed to think what her mother's fierce energies would have accomplished, 
had they been coupled with Mrs. Peniston's resources. Lily had abundant energy of her own, but it was restricted by the necessity of adapting herself to her aunt's habits. She saw that at all costs she must keep Mrs. Peniston's favour till, as Mrs. Bart would have phrased it, she could stand on her own legs. Lily had no mind for the vagabond life of the poor relation, and to adapt herself to Mrs. Peniston she had, to some degree, to assume that lady's passive attitude. She had fancied at first that it would be easy to draw her aunt into the whirl of her own activities, but there was a static force in Mrs. Peniston, against which her niece's efforts spent themselves in vain. To attempt to bring her into active relation with life was like tugging at a piece of furniture which had been screwed to the floor. She did not, indeed, expect Lily to remain equally immovable. She had all the American guardian's indulgence for the volatility of youth. She had indulgence also for certain other habits of her niece's. It seemed to her natural that Lily should spend all her money on dress, and she supplemented the girl's scanty income by occasional, handsome presents, meant to be applied to the same purpose. Lily, who was intensely practical, would have preferred a fixed allowance. But Mrs. Peniston liked the periodical recurrence of gratitude evoked by unexpected checks, and was perhaps shrewd enough to perceive that such a method of giving kept alive in her niece a salutary sense of dependence. Beyond this, Mrs. Peniston had not felt called upon to do anything for her charge. She had simply stood aside and let her take the field. Lily had taken it, at first with the confidence of assured possessorship, then with gradually narrowing demands, till now she found herself actually struggling for a foothold on the broad space which had once seemed her own for the asking. How it happened she did not yet know. Sometimes she thought it was because Mrs. Peniston had been too passive, and again she feared it was because she herself had not been passive enough. Had she shown an undue eagerness for victory? Had she lacked patience, pliancy, and dissimulation? Whether she charged herself with these faults or absolved herself from them, made no difference in the sum total of her failure. Younger and plainer girls had been married off by dozens, and she was nine and twenty, and still Miss Bart. She was beginning to have fits of angry rebellion against fate, when she longed to drop out of the race and make an independent life for herself. But what manner of life would it be? She had barely enough money to pay her dressmaker's bills and her gambling debts, and none of the desultory interest which she dignified with the name of tastes was pronounced enough to enable her to live contentedly in obscurity. Ah, no! She was too intelligent not to be honest with herself. She knew she hated dinginess as much as her mother had hated it, and to her last breath she meant to fight against it, dragging herself up again and again above its flood, till she gained the bright pinnacles of success, which presented such a slippery surface to her clutch. End of chapter 3